Hey everyone, how are you doing today? Got a bright sunny day here in West Lawn, Pennsylvania. Thought I'd take a little bit of time, put out another video, share some more great stuff with you all. And um, what I'd like to do is go back into our study of Romans chapter 2. And uh, we are going to do that, but over the past week or so I felt a little bit of a leading, stirring inside to go back and discuss a few things we had mentioned at the end of the last video, and specifically regarding Hebrews chapter 10, which we did get into. So I'd like to go back there today, um, Hebrews chapter 10, for just a little bit, uh, talk about some of these things, and then hopefully if we get through those things, we can jump back into Romans chapter 2 and continue our study there. But Hebrews chapter 10... <clears throat> Um, I'm going to uh, start here, I guess, in verse 1, and uh, just kind of continue along the, the path that we were on last time at the end of the video. Hebrews 10, verse 1, it says, For the law, referring to the law of Moses, another way we can state that is the dead letter of Scripture, for the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of of the things. And so you'll find today that people who are really hell-bent on keeping the dead letter of Scripture because they think that by doing so they are making and keeping God happy with them in heaven and avoiding getting on his bad side, you're going to find that those people, those ministers, quote-unquote, really do not have a lot of substance to offer. Because when we're looking at the law being a shadow of good things to come, well, if it's a shadow, there's no substance to it. Shadows don't have substance. Shadows have shade and darkness, but a shadow doesn't have something that can impart clarity. And so when you are dealing with anyone, really, who is still bent today on keeping the law, you'll always find that they perceive, they have really a perverted image of their Heavenly Father. They perceive Him as a Pharaoh in heaven, uh, a great red dragon who is ever crouching and waiting to, to punish disobedience and reward obedience. They will always stress and emphasize what God is after is obedience. And uh, they don't understand the Father's heart because it's very clear and obvious that, well, they've never read the parable of the two prodigal sons and understood much, if any of it, because we find a father in the parable of the two prodigal sons who isn't out to punish our disobedience. He's not really out to reward our obedience either. What he's really focused on is this identity crisis that all of humanity continues to suffer with in this present world that we live in. You know, people taking and basing their identities on their gender, their skin color, their ethnicity, all of this outward stuff and the focus of not only the world, well, the world has always been a little squirrely, but uh, sadly enough, the focus of the church. Um, I often wonder where are the voices, the heavenly voices that are, that are willing to discuss this stuff. I know they're out there. I'm, I know my, my experience and exposure may be limited, but... Um, in general, as a whole, the church has not been a true heavenly voice regarding these things. And um, the longer we continue to focus on our gender, <laughs> whatever we think our gender is, our skin color, our ethnicity, and basically demand attention, affirmation, and value for those things, you know, whatever physical lineage we descended through, and all of that egotistic stuff, um, it's very evident that our focus is not where it should be, and that is on the love of the Father that hung in the physical body of Jesus Christ on the cross. And uh, 
the the enormity of what his death revealed concerning our union with the Father in Christ. And as long as we're going to be focusing on all that other stuff, we're really technically on an experiential level settling for dwelling in the outer court. Because that's all this stuff is, folks. It's the, the skin color, the, eth the ethnicity, the gender, all this confusion and mixture in the head that so many people are going through today. This identity, this ongoing identity crisis is really the result of our settling for remaining on an experiential day-to-day -day basis in the outer court. We don't understand where this Christ, where this anointing, this anointed one truly dwells. Um, you know, although the outer court is uh, part of his tabernacle, it is not, it is not the source, it is not the, uh, it is not the emphasis. We're getting caught up in the details. And we're getting misled by the world and the church because of an absence of a true prophetic voice. We're, we're getting duped into thinking that, you know, these are all of the things that matter and they don't matter. What, it's amazing to me how when Samuel, the prophet Samuel, was sent to the house of Jesse to anoint a new king over <coughs> mailman. Timing is always impeccable. But when the prophet Samuel um, was sent to the house of Jesse to anoint <laughs> a new king over Israel. And, um, you know, the, the tallest, most handsome of Jesse's sons passed before Samuel. You know, Samuel is pondering in his heart, you know, surely the Lord's anointed is, is before him. This has to be the one. And the voice of the Lord came to Samuel and emphatically, clearly stated, do not look upon his appearance or the height of his stature. Don't look on the appearance. Don't look on the height of his stature. I mean, don't look on the lack of height of stature. He said, because the Lord does not see as man sees. Man, here it, here it comes, wait for it. Man looks on the outward appearance. It's amazing to me after all these centuries and in the light of the current world climate of today, we still have failed to get this through our thick skulls that the Lord does not look on the appearance. He does not see as man sees. Man is always emphasizing the outward. He said the Lord looks on the heart. And what's amazing about that whole encounter and scenario at Jesse's house was, you know, back in those days when the prophet came to town, there was an announcement that there would be a feast. I mean, I mean, everybody wanted to come and be in the presence of the prophet. But what's interesting about that is that David, who was the youngest of Jesse's eight sons, he's out still in the field uh, watching over his father's flock with his little harp in his hand writing love songs to the Lord and keeping watch over those sheep. And old David, in his heart, is like, yeah, I'm not into the running to the whole prophetic conference to prophetic conference thing. I'm just going to stay here, enjoy the presence of the Lord. I don't really care what the rest of my father's house is doing because I'm, I'm sure as the youngest of eight, he's probably thinking they're all a bunch of wingnuts anyway. So I'm just going to stay here and Enjoy the presence of the Lord. I don't care who's coming to town. I'm just going to stay here, enjoy this presence, and keep watch over my father's flock. So they actually had a, Samuel actually had a send to have basically David dragged to this feast. <laughs> so he could anoint him to be king. Because that's exactly the kind of guy the Lord is looking for. He's not looking, and, and girl, the guy and gal that he's looking for. is It's not the one who's, running after a prophetic word here and there and everywhere. It's not, it's not somebody who's looking for the next, you know, major prophet to lay hands on them. He's looking for the people who are like more in love with him and his presence 
And, uh, and in regard to being good stewards of what the Lord has put in their care in the present, then he is looking for, you know, some big name somebody. It's, it's always ironic how, you know, this stuff is in the Word of God, it's in the Scriptures, and we just keep bumbling over it, stumbling over it, and it just, it never sinks in because we've been so brainwashed and programmed by the world and the church as to what's important. And I was just reading this this morning um, in Luke. Uh, we'll go back to Hebrews 10 in a second, but uh, in Luke, uh, this is this is quite profound. Um, Jesus is talking uh, in context. He's he's, he's kind of talking and um, upbraiding the Pharisees because of their covetous and their love of money, which yeah, that's not an issue today, is it? Um, but he says here uh, in Luke 16 verse 13, he says. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, mammon doesn't necessarily just mean money. However, in the context, it is talking about money and the false sense of power and control we believe that it gives us over one another. Hence, all the fightings, all the wars, because, hey, I mean... Isn't the goal of life to be the one at the end of the day who gets to have their finger on the trigger calling the shots? And what better way to help us achieve that than M-O-N-E-Y, right? Money. Love of money, the love of it, is the root of all evil. And honestly, one of the most simple proofs that we have conquered greed. One of the most simple proofs that we have conquered greed is in our giving. Money is a good servant, but it is one terrible master. And it seemed, I mean, as, as, there, as there is a continual ongoing blindness regarding the Father's love, in Christ, as there continues to be an ongoing blindness and disregard for that righteousness of God, the Father's love in Christ, um, you know, men will continue to uh, worship themselves more and more. And unfortunately, one of the things that uh, men try to use as a tool to worship themselves and promote themselves the most is money. And what's really sad is in the end, in one last breath, we lose it all. Can't take it with us. But man is money a revealer of the heart and what the heart truly values. I remember years ago, it ticks a lot of people off when I say it, but it's the truth. Um, I remember years ago, I was sitting in my office and I just felt this, this voice of the Lord just came strong within me and said... Always remember, son, that you're as busy as you want to be. You make time for who and what is important to you. And he said, and your money is going into what you truly value. There's no escape. And there isn't. But check this out. I don't want to get onto that track totally today, but he says, um, one more time, Luke 16, verse 13, he says, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot be a servant of the Lord and be under con the control and manipulation of money. Now, mammon also means, in the literal, mammon just means that which you trust in. You cannot serve God and that which you trust in apart from him which can be money, which is, I mean, aside, aside from the kingdom of God, Jesus spoke more about money and the entrapments of material possessions than anything else. In fact, on Jesus' uh, priority list, if you want to call it that, or, or regarding topics of discussion, the only thing he talked more about in general is the, the uh, entrapments of the love of money 
and the desire for material possessions, power, and wealth over one another, the only thing he talked about more was the kingdom of God, and specifically the Father. Because everything that he was about, everything that he said, did, and demonstrated was to reveal and reflect to the world the lost image of the Father. And it's what he's still doing in his high priestly ministry today. And he's longing to do it, and he is doing it through a company of people, showing the world what the true heart of the Father is like, being uh, uh, moving in and through a people who can show the Father or show the world the heart of the Father. But he says to the Pharisees, and it says in the Pharisees, while he was saying these things, you cannot serve God and mammon, you cannot serve God and that which you trust, apart from God, you cannot serve God and your money. And it says, and the Pharisees also who were covetous, well, what were they covetous of? Money, power, position, authority, control over one another. Hello, America, isn't the election coming up in November? Isn't that what the political spirit is all about? It says, the Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things and they derided him. I mean, man, you will, you will not stir up somebody's ire more than when you start touching and allowing the spirit through you to touch on their money and their possessions. Because most people are controlled by their money and their possessions, their fear of not having it, their fear of not having enough, their identity that's wrapped up in the material possessions that they have. You start messing with that, the reason why their ire becomes so stirred is because their identity is wrapped up in that stuff. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. Yeah, like we've... We followed after that. <laughs> like we've really followed after that, huh? We made a mess of it, haven't we? That's why we have yard sales every week, and our attics and our basements and storage facilities are loaded with crap that, you know, we've purchased, forgotten about, and then one day we, we wake up and we realize how much garbage we've accumulated in life and how it's cluttering everything and making a mess that we can't even walk around our own house. But yet that's, those same people will say, all oh, preachers want is your money. But, but look at where yours is sitting, <laughs> in, in junk. It's <laughs> littering the house and storage facilities across the country. But again, the money that was used to purchase all that stuff is connected, it's connected to a heart that values it. And so all that stuff is really an outward expression of what the heart values. I'm, I'm waiting and wondering where there's gonna be, when there's gonna be a people who actually value the true gospel. I'm not talking American churchianity, that's over. I'm talking the true gospel. But I digress. Check this out. Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things, and they derided him. Um, and he said unto them, he said, You are they which justify yourselves before men, always seeking the praise of men. He said, But God knows your hearts. There it is again. That's what Samuel said to Jesse. He said, or excuse me, the Lord said to Samuel, and Samuel went to Jesse's house. Look not on the height of his stature or on his appearance. The Lord does not see as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance. The Lord looks on the heart. God knows your hearts. And this is what Jesus says. I love it. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. And what do men highly esteem in context? Oh, the outward appearance and the money that we trust that we can, with which we can create that outward experience or appearance, we trust the money, um, we esteem the money, the power, and the, the, the false sense of authority control that it gives us so that we can keep creating this outward appearance and of course marketing and merchandising it to people so that we can portray ourselves to the world in the light that we would like them to see us 
But in the middle of it all, the Lord's looking at the heart. He's weighing the spirits, the motivations behind why we're doing what we're doing. And so, um, yeah, man, man's, man's view of things. You know, Proverbs talks, out, talks about how men will praise you when you do well for yourself. Men will praise you when you become, you know, financially, outwardly blessed and prosperous. And they'll even want to know how you, how you did it. And, you know, they want you to write books about it so they can copy your magic formula. But the Lord looks on the heart. The Lord weighs the spirits. And those motivations are not always pure, especially where there is no revelation of the Lamb. Especially where there's no revelation of the Lamb. So, I said that because over back in Hebrews chapter 10, let's get back there, the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things. The, we'll, we'll keep going here. Um, it, again, if you're, if, you're, if you're trying to abide by the dead letter of Scripture, the fact of the matter is, is you are more caught up in the outward appearance, but when you are focusing, when I am focusing, when we are focusing on the dead letter of Scripture, the law of Moses, however you want to say it, we're actually dealing in the ministry of shadows. And if all I have to offer people is shadows, there's no substance. It says, the law can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect, complete, mature. Um, fully full of the, the goodness of the Lord. There's no way. Because... In the ministry of shadows, which is connected to the Old Testament sacrifices, there is no clarity. Verse 2 says, For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Well, yeah, if they could have made us perfect, if they could have completed in us what was lacking, then those Old Testament sacrifices would have ceased to be offered. But they had to continually be offered year by year, over and over again, for the same mistakes. The same, uh, the same areas where we kept missing the mark. So all those sacrifices did that were required year by year would be, they, all they did was continually remind us of how we kept falling short. And how we keep missing it, and how we lack something, and how there's something missing, and It says, because the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. Ah, so there is a sacrifice that was offered once, which if we wrap our heads around it, if we comprehend it by the revelation of the Spirit, should produce within us no more conscience of sin and sins. And I have good news. That sacrifice has been offered. In fact, it was offered 2,000 years ago. And unfortunately, because the church as a whole hasn't desired to look into these things, we've just, I mean, we have completely, well, not completely, but we have partially shelved a good part of the New Testament. Um, and that has massively contributed to the state of affairs that we can see throughout the climate and landscape of our current world. We've messed with this stuff, we've perverted it, we've held a lot of it back, and all it has done is further contribute, like I said, to this ongoing identity crisis. Verse three, but in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Oh, of course. And even today when you talk to Christians, they're, they're more focused on sin than they are anything else. I mean, most in their speech and in their heart motivation, most more Christians than not worship the devil and worship sin uh, rather than show any evidence of a deep intimate knowing of this loving Heavenly Father who actually has, has kept and is keeping no record of the wrongs ever committed against him. 
Because that's what love does. That's who love is. It says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins, completely remove them. All those the blood of bulls and goats did for sin was temporarily cover it. But none of those sacrifices could permanently take it away, erase it, and divorce us from it. None of those Old Testament sacrifices that were connected to the dead letter of Moses' law. And see, when we allow ourselves by ignorance to come, or choice, to come back under the influence of that dead letter of Scripture, with it, there will also transfer into our conscience an awareness of sin. And when we look at the world, all we're going to see is sin everywhere. It's like one famous preacher I, I heard just a couple weeks ago, you know, he was on the internet, expect the Antichrist. I'm not expecting the Antichrist. I'm expecting the manifestation of Christ. I'm not expecting Antichrist. I am expecting the manifestation of his spirit, the leading of his spirit, the manifestation of his glory. Why would I live my life in a continual fear and expectation of the Antichrist when I can expect Christ himself to manifest in and through me and touch others? Which would you rather, people? And besides that, Antichrist has been here for 2,000 years. I don't know if some Christians just never choose to read first the book of 1 John. But, I mean, seriously. Um, let's read over here. Let me see here. Oh. 1 John chapter 2. Just let's look at it. Yeah, well. We'll link a bunch of stuff together here in the time that we have. 1 John chapter 2. Let's go over here. Verse 15, I love this. Because this is going to tie into the covetousness of the Pharisees, what we talked about, and how what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination to God. Um, 1 John chapter 2. Verse 15, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Now, he's not talking about not loving the people that are in the world. He's talking about loving the systems of the world, the way that the world does things. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. How can we truly come to a deeper, intimate knowing of the Father and his love for us and then be an expression and reflection of that love when we're caught up in what the world values. There's no way. Verse 16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Just think of the marketing and merchandising and advertising strategies of the world, the commercials and all this other stuff. It all revolves around the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And if you don't know that you need something, well, they'll create an advertising campaign that proves to you that you need something, basically tell that shows us what our life is without it, what our life could be with it, creates within us that lust and passion for it, and then when we get it, we have a sense of pride because now this is going to give me a life that is better than those who don't have it. And they say that there's nothing in the scriptures that relates to today. It's because they're blind. All of this is pertinent to today. His words are spirit in their life. And they intersect on every area of life that we live on this planet. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passes away, and the lust thereof. It's all going to die out. But he that does the will of God abides forever. Now what is that doing of the will of God? Well, brother, it's keeping his commandments. No. Well, brother, it's doing what the Bible says because the Bible is basic instructions before leaving earth. No. <laughs> what is it this he that does the will of God abides forever? Another way you can say this is he, whosoever, 
that loves with the same love of the Father abides forever. 1 Corinthians 13 echoes it. Now abides faith, hope, and love. Now abide faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. See, folks, in the end, the only thing that is really going to truly endure is the love of the Father. And the only way that we can love with the love of the Father is if we have that love first revealed in us. I cannot love with the love of the Father in and of my own ability because of my own intelligence or my own effort. The love of the Father is the revelation that the eyes of my understanding must capture. The light of it, the Spirit must cause the eyes of my understanding to capture that light, to comprehend it. Because once I see it, once I become aware of it, I become the carrier of it. And now I'm living my life, quote, by the leading of the Spirit, but what is that? Well, the love of God is shed abroad in my hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Remember, we talked a couple videos ago about the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God, but to whom is the Spirit leading them? Next couple verses, we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Hello, coronavirus pandemic. We have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father, where is the Spirit leading the true sons? to a deep, intimate knowledge of Abba the Father. Because once we connect with that true image of the Father, of whom is the Lamb, not a dragon, all of a sudden, our, the eyes of our understanding comprehend it, the eyes of our heart embrace it, and all of a sudden, without any effort on our own, there's a transformation that takes place as we behold in that mirror the glory of the Lord. We become metamorphosized into that very image. Well, what is that image? The image of the Father being the Lamb. The image of the Father seen in the Lamb. The love of the Father witnessed in and through the Lamb. We become that expression. And from that moment on, we are led by it. And that that leading is not leading me back again into that spirit of bondage of fear where I'm living my life continually as if I'm walking on eggshells because I'm afraid that I haven't applied all the scriptural principles in the Bible enough to make and keep this dragon happy with me in heaven. The true leading of the Spirit is not taking me back there. He's impelling me and moving me to go forward into things that pertain unto the Lord Jesus. I'm being empowered by grace. I'm being empowered by something supernatural, someone supernatural. I'm no longer living as a slave to my own effort. There was a prophet one time many years ago, probably, wow, huh, almost 30 years ago that I ran into and he said these words and I'll never I've never forgotten them he said if you can know the leading and the voice of the spirit he said then you're then John the days of the labor intensity of your own self effort will come to an end if you can know the leading and the voice of the spirit then the days of your labor intensity of self-effort will come to an end. I never forgot that. But oh, is it true. It is absolutely true. No more struggling, no more striving, resting in his love, allowing that love to lead us and guide us toward one another, allowing that love to transform us into the very expression of that love as it is seen in the Lamb, who is the true expression of the Father. We become the uh, the brightness of his glory. We become the express image of his person because he's in us and we're in him. No separation, just a, com a complete intoxication and enjoyment of the union that we share with the Father in the body of Jesus Christ. Wow, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. He that is joined unto the Lord, one spirit with him. 
But is our attention there? Or is it distracted by all this other stuff going around? See, that's why Jesus taught. He said, you know, in those days, he said, the love of many shall wax cold. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. That word love in the Greek is agape. It's the love of God. Well, how can the love of God wax cold if it hasn't already had a place in people? And that's talking about Christians. It's talking about believers. Their love is going to wax cold. But notice what he said. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So what does that mean about the focus of those whose love is waxing cold? They're focusing on the wrong things. They're focusing on the bad behavior of people, and they've gotten their eyes off of the love of the Father seen in the cross of Jesus Christ. So once sin becomes the focus and the emphasis, guess what we revert back to? The law. It comes in so subtly. But when sin is the emphasis, I guarantee you, the law is not far behind. That was, the, that was the issue at the Ephesian church in the book of the Revelation, the first church, which is part of the first thunder. The first thunder deals with the, uh, the earth, carnality. Um, it, it revolves around a confrontation occurring between the first attribute of the Spirit of Christ and the main attribute of the Spirit of Christ, which is the spirit of divine love that causes rest, versus the first abomination of the self-righteous spirit, or the antichrist spirit, or the beast, which is a proud look. First abomination of the antichrist or self-righteous spirit is a proud look. Proverbs 6, verse 16 and 19. The first attribute of the Spirit of Christ is divine love. So divine love is confronting... Um, yeah, we're going to get into this in a second. Um, divine love is confronting that proud look. You can't have a proud look without a proud, self-righteous heart. And it's revolving around the carnality. And so what the Ephesian church did, the first church did, was they left their first love. They forgot that the only reason they have what they have with the Lord is because He first loved them. They removed their focus and attention from that reality. And as a result, you can read it in uh, Revelation chapter 2, they actually began practicing 10 different things. You know what 10 is the number of? The law. The shadow of good things to come, says Hebrews chapter 10. So they, they shifted their focus off of love, the, the Father's love as it is seen in the Lamb. As a result, their focus turned upon and, and, and emphasized the bad behavior and sin, uh, sinful living that they saw in people. So by default, they start practicing ten different things. It's the manifestation or proof that they're once again under that spirit of bondage to fear, that spirit of the dead letter of Scripture. They donned themselves as the apostolic police force against sin. The Ephesian church... Um, anointed themselves as the royal righteous rangers against all unrighteousness. And what happened was, they lost their ability to communicate and reflect the light of the love that they once experienced. See, because iniquity was abounding, their love grew cold. And so it is today. Because that parable of the book of the Revelation... Yes, it happened in the past though, with, with those seven churches, but it is rampant today as well. See, the revelation of Jesus Christ never changes. It, it definitely goes deeper and higher and wider. It's a continually unfolding and enfolding into itself revelation that is bottomless. It knows no limits. But truth is truth. It's, it'll stand the test of time. And without that revelation of the Lamb, without that understanding of the Father's love in the Lamb, the past is going to repeat itself. <laughs> the past is going to repeat itself. You know, I know historians who, you know, put out a lot of books and 
videos and stuff on how Hitler rose to power. And we're so wrapped up and caught up in ourselves today that we can't even see a lot of those similarities beginning to resurface. We keep giving away our freedoms. We keep trusting in government blindly. We, and all of it is, I don't want to make a political statement here. It's not, it's not a political issue. It's a heart issue. We haven't recognized the king that the Lord has installed on Mount Zion. And because our eyes have been diverted away from him, and we are valuing these outward things, we're, we're trying to come up with ways to sustain further and also achieve more and more, I should say it this way, because our eyes are on those outward things, we're trying to come up with methods and means to sustain those things, because our value comes from it. And in regard to things that we have not yet achieved in and of our own desires, we're trying to come up and concoct, come up with and concoct newfangled ways by which we can not only achieve things in the future, but guarantee that the way of achieving it is preserved. And all that stuff revolves around us serving us, us emphasizing us. There is already a king who has been installed on Mount Zion. His name is Jesus Christ. And um, we need to get our eyes back on him because natural government is okay, but it's never, it was never meant to be the source of our identity and security. Neither was our ethnicity, our skin color, our gender. None of that stuff has anything to do with our true God-given identity. One of these days, we're going to get into a lengthy Bible study on Apostle Paul's dung pile list that's found in Philippians chapter 3. And if, I guarantee you, if any of our identity revolves around any of that stuff I just mentioned, we are going to be highly offended. But it needs to be dealt with. We're making life in general far too complicated. And we, we keep, I'm not just talking about the United States, I'm talking about mankind in general. We keep surrendering our freedoms that every person should have on this planet to to really governments which are nothing more than men and women who've been installed in a public office that we're trusting as our source. And if you want to really, the, the truth about it, you know, all the visions of nations and the subsequent rise of their governments <coughs> came about as a result of the Lord scattering them where they were attempting to build a tower called Babel. All ethnic and racial divisions, country divisions, and the subsequent governments that would arise to rule over them came from that place. And just so you and I can be clear, that word uh, uh, Babel, well that's that's the root of the word Babylon that is given to the harlot church in the book of the Revelation. Initially, it really wasn't a political thing regarding a certain country and its government. Initially, what it really was, was it was an attempt to build a tower that had steps that could help you reach heaven. And what's really amazing about that is that word tower in the Hebrew is really the word rostrum, and that tower is actually what it means is pulpit. Look it up. It was a pulpit they were building that was full of steps. You couldn't necessarily see it from the outside, but it was full of steps on the inside that showed people the way to get to heaven. Hello, American Christianity. Have, see, <laughs> the tower back then never got built. The Lord interrupted it. But today, we've had a lot of unknowing and well-meaning people complete it. And that's what the church represents. The church is always trying to build someone's pulpit. They make it out as if this is the way to heaven. This is the open door to heaven. And within that pulpit 
There are multitudes and myriads of steps and formulas and patterns and equations and outlines and sequences and sequences of steps and protocols and processes and processings and healing processes and prophetic processings and works in progress. <sighs> Hold on, I need a cup of coffee to wet my whistle. <laughs> and poor unsuspecting naive people have fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. And look at the way things are today. Still marketing and merchandising steps and formulas and patterns. And, you know, if you do this, you know, it goes back to our study, our exposition on Romans chapter 10, where it says, don't say in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven? Where'd that come from? That's a reference to the Tower at Babel. Who shall ascend into heaven? Here are the steps with which you can bring Christ, the anointing, down from above. Don't say in your heart, don't let this spirit of mind or heart attitude be within you. Who shall descend into the deep? That is to work up, bring up, or drum up Christ or some heavenly encounter as if he is deaf, dumb, and blind in death and he can't hear anything. So we try to work up something with a, 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 a frenzied fervor. He said, but what does it say? What does the righteousness which is of faith say? What does the love of the Father, which comes alive in us as a result of hearing the true gospel, what does that love of the Father actually say? Ah, the word Christ is near you. Christ is in you. The hope of glory, he's already in you. And Paul said that is the word of faith which we preach. It's the word that I have, it's the word that flows out of the love to which I have been awakened by the gospel, which said love already dwells in my heart. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him for us all, how shall he not with him, with that indwelling Christ, freely give us all things? Are we attentive to it? Are we attuned to it? Are we leaning there? Are we resting in it? Are we, are we placing our intention, our, our, our attention, our affection there inwardly in our hearts where he dwells? Paul said, that's the word which we preach. Moment by moment, day by day, wherever I find myself, I keep leaning into him. I keep turning inwardly and kind of like sitting back into a big old comfy, like easy boy, lazy boy chair in the throne of my spirit. And I'm just taking all of him in. And what did Jesus say? He said, in that day when you're delivered up before men, he said, don't take any thought or wonder how you're, what you're going to say. What you, it'll be given to you in that very hour for it is not you who speak. It is the spirit of your father, which speak, spirit of your father. Say it one more time. Spirit of your father that speaks in you. Paul said, that is the word of faith which we preach. All that pharisaical learning, all that legalistic learning that Paul was in, Saul of Tarsus, I should say, was an expert in, he had to let go of it all to discover a different word that was residing, that the Lord is causing to reside in him. He suffered the loss of all things to apprehend, to get a grip on what the Lord is actually revealing within him. And so it will be with us. We have to lose everything. No one's exempt. Not me, not you, not. We have to count it all, like Apostle Paul said, dung. Feces in the Greek. Kaka. It's all a bunch of shit. <laughs> because it is. But to apprehend this and to hold on to this inside, yeah, I, I, have, to, I have to let go of all this other stuff. Anything in which I'm trusting, in my, in my own ability, my own strength, even my Bible study, my, my Bible reading, my quote prayer times, my scripture confessions, my guitar playing, whatever. 
in comparison to this, I got to count that all but done. I got to let it go. Sure, he can bring stuff to me like a tool, like a toolbox that I can, you know, pick out, or like a uh, a quiver full of arrows from time to time where I can pick out certain things that I need. But of course, under his influence and leading. But my identity is not wrapped up in that one thing. He is my identity. We got to let go of all of that. I can't count it all loss. Whatever kind of scriptural expert we think we are, you got to let it go, and you got to reduce. We have, we have to reduce ourselves to like what Joel said in chapter two. He said, "Rend open your heart, and not your garments. Let it be an inward openness to the Lord, and quit this outward show with all this external, superficial, as Apostle Paul said." Shit. Still love me? So with that being said, let's end on this note because I do have to get going today. I don't have a time for a longer video. Uh, 1 John chapter 2, where we were. Remember verse 17, 1 John chapter 2, the world passes away and the lust thereof. Everything, this outward stuff that all revolves around the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, folks, it's passing away. Look at what's happening today. It's just, stuff is dying out. Stuff is, it's just, people are realizing it's, it's all this stuff was not really cracked up to what it, what it was meant to be or portrayed to be. And it's going to continue, trust me. Because in the end, the only thing that's going to abide is faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these things is love. So if you want to know what the future holds, this high priest, Jesus Christ, who is a high priest of good things to come, I'm going to tell you what the future holds. It's going to be full of faith, hope, and love. His kind. Living in us, breathing through us toward one another as we embrace one another as sons of the living God. No emphasis on the outward appearance. Who cares? The Lord looks on the heart, so if we know the Father, we'll be looking on the heart as well. Regardless of skin color, ethnicity, gender, gender, none of it matters. Verse 18, little children, it is the last time. Remember I was telling you guys about that minister, expect the Antichrist. I guess this is why I got on this tirade. Expect the Antichrist. Well, let's look at this for just a second. Verse 18, 1 John 2, little children, it is the last time. This is back 2,000 years ago. It is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now... Are there many antichrists? In other words, why am I still expecting a future antichrist when John, when he wrote this, said, look, you guys have heard that antichrist shall come. Even now are there many antichrists whereby you know that it is the last time. Antichrist has been here for... One of the things the antichrist spirit, that self-righteous spirit of mind or attitude of heart, tries to do is it tries to move us to exalt and promote self and to move us to amass as much money and material possessions as wealth as we can find so that we can lord it over one another, promote, want, promote ourselves, have authority over one, or so, one another, so at the end of the day we get to be the ones with our finger on the trigger, calling the shots and being in control because the spirit of Antichrist is a fear-dominated spirit. It is under the influence of an obedience-oriented, performance-driven lifestyle. It is a fearful spirit, and it is full of insecurity. That's what the Antichrist spirit does. And so it is reaching, grabbing it, trying to grab for straws, because it is trying to find something in this life that it can attach itself to, so that it can give itself meaning and value. It has no concept of the love of the Father. That's why people get into politics, because they want to make a difference. That's why people, they say they want to help people, but you know, sometimes when you look at what people say versus how they live, it's like, you really doing this to help people, or are you doing it to promote you so you can leave yourself some sort of, quote, legacy? Always trying to find meaning, always trying to find value. If that's what you're looking for, how can you give the kind of love that hung in Christ on the cross, how can you give it to people when you're looking for meaning and value itself 
and you can't see that your value was determined by the price that your father was willing to pay for you, and that price was the blood of his own son. If that doesn't give you value, meaning, a sense of self-worth, what are you looking for on this planet to do that? You're not going to find it. Who's in office? Whether we have one of our own in there, whether we don't have one of our own in there, what they'll do for the economy, what they'll do for my paycheck to make life more comfortable to me, so I'll have a shot at making it. It's all antichrist. There's no emphasis on the love of the Father in us that we can pour out to one another versus our trying to have authority over one another. Verse 19, 1 John 2, they went out from us, and I could talk on this for months, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. True love doesn't separate itself from people. True love doesn't separate itself from the brethren. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. True love doesn't separate from fellowship with one another. It inspires it. And look at all the separation today. Divided, separated, pretty much conquered by few. And we're oblivious to what's going on. Slave to fear, slave to men, slave to their opinions, slaves to government. Where is the life that Jesus rose from the dead with and its piercing, penetrating power in the light of the Father's love? Well, that's all I got for today, folks. I have to run. I got some responsibilities I need to take care of. Hey, check out our website, www.todaysvoice.org. Uh, you can sign up to be on our email list. You can choose to donate if you'd like to. We'd really appreciate that. Uh, to those who do donate and contribute, thank you very much. You are literally helping us to keep going. So thank you for that. Uh, we look forward to sharing with you more next time. Until then, have a great rest of your day. Enjoy your weekend. And just remember that Kelly and I, uh, we love you and appreciate you. All right, we'll talk to you next time.